left in the shortened spring session. Lawmakers are working through the weekend to find compromise on two key issues, the state budget and how to stop a concerning rise in crime. On Friday, a group of Democrats from the House and Senate finally revealed part of their anti-crime package. They say the first wave of bills is focused on getting to the root of the issue. In addition to creating a new task force, the plan would set up a statewide anonymous tip line and reconfigure witness protection program with a $20 million addition in funding. A long list of community programs like early childhood education, after school programming, they'd also get a boost. Another bill would create a so-called co-responder unit for some parts of the state that would deploy social workers along with police to help focus on mental health issues and violent survivors, among other things. We must immediately address the public safety issues concerning families, but we also need to look at the long-term comprehensive issues and making sure that we are funding the areas of the budget that will actually create more public safety in our communities. Democrats who have supermajorities in both chambers say they'll be introducing even more new legislation this week because there's just five days left until the scheduled end of session. There does seem to be one bipartisan agreement. That's to pass a new law to stop organized retail crime theft, uh, which has become so prevalent during the pandemic. The plan would expand the power of prosecutors to go after criminals who steal retail with the intent to sell it for profit. And as lawmakers debate the governor's $45 billion budget plan, there is some good news for our historically cash-strapped state. The damage of the two-year budget stalemate that ended in 2017, mostly taken care of. Illinois controller Susana Mendoza says the state has been paying its bills within two weeks for the last few months. That's right. No more billion dollar bill backlog, but we aren't out of the woods just yet. The state is in desperate need of some cash reserve. It's rainy day fund now holds barely enough money to keep the state running for 24 hours. Illinois controller Susanna Mendoza joins me this morning to talk about all of that and more. Madam controller, it's good to see you. It's the first time since the pandemic began. It's wonderful to see you, Paul. I can't believe we're in studio, right? This so, is new for me. Yeah, we're still getting used to it. So the state has paid back the 279 million uh, in short term borrowing. Mm -hmm. from 15 state funds that were needed to recover. A lot of people say, well, that's the federal COVID funds you used to pay that off. Um, but, but the governor and you have said, well, actually, we got some better returns than, than we expected. How did we pay it down? What was the source? Yes, so keep in mind, this didn't happen overnight, right? So I've, I'm going to give you a little context here. When I became controller, I walked into a 210-day average bill payment cycle. So businesses, on average, had to wait almost a year to get paid. Some were... Uh, waiting two years to get paid. Um, we had a bill backlog that got as bad as $16.7 billion. And we had eight consecutive credit downgrades during the best economic bull market in our lifetime. That happened before I became controller. Since taking office, I've worked very hard from day one to uh, bring down the bill backlog. And one of the tools that I used, we talked about this before on your show, was uh, championing a bond deal that allowed us to take $6 billion of the almost $17 billion that we were paying 12% interest on, brutal, and refinance that at 3.5%. So that was done in December of 2017. It allowed me to take $6 billion, find ever, every single federal matching bill I could that would give me 50 cents on the dollar, and turn $6 billion into $9 billion and chop that off of the bill backlog. Using similar strategies, fund borrowing, which you just pointed out, we right. just paid down, um, because we had better than expected tax revenues coming in this year, is that every time we've had more money coming in than expected, we've used it to pay down debts. But this is all without using federal stimulus funds. All right, so that clarifies that. I do want to talk about this rainy day fund, yeah. which apparently you've said we won't get through the day <laughs> with what we have in there, about $60,000. So um, you're trying to, you're lobbying state lawmakers to get a, a bill passed that would fund that, that fund automatically. How how does that work? What's the reception? So what I want to do is make sure that now that we are out of the bill backlog and we now have an accounts payable, which means that we're paying all of our bills well within 30 days. My oldest bill today is 17 days old, so pretty amazing. Um, what we want to do now is start saving money so that we can weather a, God forbid, another economic downturn that's of no fault of the states, right? We saw what happened during 9-11. We saw what happened to our state budget during the budget um, impasse. We saw what happened during the market crash of 2008. We have to be able to with, withstand any kind of downturn like that, but you can't do it with the $60,000 that I inherited in the Rainy Day Fund. And we have $24 million in there today, but in order to feel comfortable, we should have about 5 to 7.5% 
of our revenues, which would be two and a half to three billion dollars in reserves. So if we pass legislation, which I'm going to get this done, I don't know if it's going to happen in this session, but I've never said, I've never made a promise that I haven't kept. This will be my, my what you hear me talk about all the time next year, if it doesn't happen this year, and that's going to be to codify into law automatic deposits into both the rainy day fund and the budget, the uh, pension stabilization fund. But when, that's when bills are not over three when billion. When our bills are under three billion. Okay. Yeah, so when we finish the year out we, in April, we would say that by the end of uh, June 30th, we expect that our um, our accounts payable, no longer a backlog, that's a bad word, the accounts payable is under $3 billion that we should be putting $200 million into one fund, $200 million into the other fund, and get our state back in shape. So let's remember, the way we got into this mess in the first place was maybe not from the best spending that went on among those controlling the government. So um, go fast forward in time when you have this rainy day fund built up, and a lot of folks in the legislature go, ooh, there's extra money, I need it. How are you going to stop it? No, no, no. See, this is this is bad practice, and this is exactly what I want to stop. And I, I use my voice very strongly in the legislature, okay? And I'm always talking about the need to be fiscally responsible and fiscally prudent. And one of the best ways to protect the appropriations that we care about, and I used to be a former legislator, when we appropriate funds to health care or to education, um, we expect that those funds are going to be there when those bills come due. But God forbid there is another economic collapse. The rainy day fund is the best way to protect those appropriations. So people shouldn't look at that as new money that we get to spend. They should be looking at as a protection and insurance policy to make sure that those things that the legislature and the governor decided were important to fund are properly funded. More importantly, if there is an economic downturn, I don't want to have to go to the marketplace and have to spend interest payments. That's like burning taxpayer money. It's setting it on fire when we have our own reserves that we don't have to pay interest on that we could tap into to get us through some of those bad months. So speaking of, of um, interest, you've gone to D.C. You're going back to D.C. again this week to lobby lawmakers to say, please don't make us pay the interest. You know, get rid of what we owe you and don't make us pay going forward. Obviously, there's things you think the money could be better spent on in the state. But if I'm with the feds, I'm going, I'm sorry, that was the terms you agreed and why shouldn't we get our money? Well, this is specific to the unemployment insurance yeah, trust sorry, fund, yes. right? We've paid all our our other interest to the, the federal government. But this specific fund is the money that was used to make sure that people still were able to feed their families, people who had lost their jobs during the pandemic uh, were given some unemployment assistance. Um, but we had to take out a loan from the federal government to get us through that, as did 28 other states in America. Now, having said that, at the time that these loans happened, which was, you know, you're going on almost two years, the federal government said, well, by September 6th of 2020, 21, mm -hmm. um, we're going to start charging you interest if you haven't paid that four and a half billion dollars back. But what happened is that that was an arbitrary date. They assumed that the pandemic would be over, states would be fully operational again, and that was just an arbitrary date. So clearly in on September 6th of 2021, we were just starting to massively spike in Omicron. We were in no condition to pay back the four and a half billion. And I led the charge with seven other states in similar positions as Illinois, who we are absolutely going to pay back the principal, which is the four and a half. Um, but we're just saying, please don't charge us an extra hundred million dollars because of some arbitrary date that had no basis in reality. One of your opponents in the current election has said, um, you're actually hiding our state's financial troubles. We're really going deeper into debt. What do you say? Well, you know, Clearly, I've been the most transparent uh, controller in the history of Illinois. That statement would only make sense on opposite day. And frankly, I'm very, very proud of the trans the monumental transparency reforms that I've shepherded through the legislature, including the Debt Transparency Act. Um, but truthfully, there's been no more transparent person than I am. And anything, any fund you want to take a look at, just go to our website. We make it all available to the public. And I'm always talking about this. But I have just a few seconds left. Sure. In ads, the governor says, we've done this, we've accomplished it. I'm sure your ads will say the same thing. Where does the credit go for, for getting us over a speed bump? Look, I think it's, it's a team effort. You know, I started the financial turnaround uh, back in 2017 with this bond deal that I had to fight Governor Brown or he didn't want to do it and uh, we got it done and that had you know that happened before Governor Pritzker with Governor Pritzker I think he's been a really strong ally and a partner in continuing the forward momentum with our finances and the legislature has been critical
critical too by passing for the last few years balanced budgets. So all of those things in tandem work together. But I would I would say that it's been really, really a major honor with the amazing team of dedicated servants that I have at the controller's office, public servants, uh, to be able to navigate the state, not through just one fiscal crisis, the worst one ever, which was the budget impasse, right. but now the pandemic. So we're getting State it controller, done. Susana Mendoza, thank you for your time in here, answering some of these questions. We appreciate it. We are going